Ah, yes, friends, on a Wednesday, it's OGP, the one giant podcast where you know the deal. Over there, you're going to see Andy Makowitz, and right in front of your face, it's me, Adam Armbrecht, breaking down the New York football giants all off season long. Andy, before we dive in, this is never more apt to ask this question. Are you healthy, wealthy, and wise? Because we are about to give New York football giants fans a very exciting picture for the off season and the season ahead. Positive vibes only want to give a shout out to my amazing wife, Kelly. Today is her oh. birthday. Hello. It's exciting. 21st birthday, Adam. A- amazing. She can legally have a glass of wine tonight. It- it's it's just a fantastic day all around. I love it. I've always said, I-, I think that you've aged very gracefully, and that's what makes you attractive to someone who's just on the verge of experiencing life in so many different facets. Uh, a tip of the hat to you, Kelly. Um, in that vein, man, celebrating, celebrating what could be the positive vibes ahead before we get into uh, Kenny Galladay, Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones, three potentially key pivotal pieces to what the Giants are going to accomplish in the upcoming season. Today marks the conclusion of the NFL annual league meetings where, um, listen, among other things, we're going to some comments from, from Brian Dable and Joe Shane. But these guys are all just having a good time down in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that the way that we really want to kind of examine this? Basically, the the annual league meeting, they're like, where can we go that's super nice on the water, 80 degrees, sunny, really fancy. Let's go to the Breakers in Palm Beach, Florida, which is like, you know, it's like 1500 a night if you've ever, you know, Googled them and like, nope, that's too expensive for me. It's a beautiful place. And if you've watched any of the uh, of some of the interviews, Kyle Shanahan had the most bloodshot eyes I've ever seen, like holding a cup of coffee, shaking. He must have had like at least 15 cocktails the night before out out in Palm Beach. But yeah, what a boondoggle it is. They're like, hey, let's just all get together in like warm weather and go to the beach, right? Well, let's be real here too, right? Like they go down for these meetings. I mean, listen, they made some changes to the overtime rules, some little adjustments for playoff football, whatever. Like, but how often? And I know like someone's like to talk about like deals go on behind the scenes or whatever, talking about the draft. Like, Nothing goes on at these things. Almost nothing ever changes. So it's, I'm, not, I'm not knocking it. If you work for a really good company and they go, hey, guess what, guys? Corporate retreat. Like right. that, That's essentially what this is. It's like a team-building exercise where they go, listen, why don't we all just knock a few back, kind of self-congratulate ourselves on how good our league is, how we cannot be broken down by any negativity. Huzzah! <laughs> we should we should set up our annual podcast meeting around the same time, maybe in like South Beach, Miami, and go down there so that we could have the serious discussions and like flesh out all the things that we need to for this upcoming season of the podcast, right? A brouhaha, a brouhaha, harumph, harumph, harumph. Yes, that's what I, listen, it's coming. And uh, listen, I guess if we're working on the same ratio, if we find ourselves a classy $45 hotel, the drinks are on me, boxo wine for everyone. Um. When we talk about some of the interviews, this is what you do get, though. A lot of conversations and interviews from head coaches, from GMs, and just kind of where they think their franchise is. And for the Giants, you do get this opportunity to see Joe Shane and Brian Dable both talking about not just players, but I think just the the, the philosophy, right? The approach that these two guys have taken in becoming the faces of the New York football Giants franchise that's in stark contrast to what we've experienced for the last handful of seasons, especially under with Joe Shane as the head coach, let alone Dave Gettleman as the GM. Yeah, so the first thing that you get, and we'll get into the comments, but just the way that Joe Shane and Dable approach interviews with the media and how they're talking about questions that are being asked, it felt like whenever people were like, Dave, why, why are you not looking at offensive tackles in the draft and he's like ha clearly you don't know what the people are in the room that we have here and and it's like mocking people for asking these pointed questions you look at you look at joe shane and and brian table the two words that come to my mind are authentic and genuine right like joe shane they ask him about saquon barkley he's like i have not made a single call about saquon have people called me sure like i you know people are interested we do not want to trade saquon and the second that this came up in the media that people were calling us. He's like, I immediately called Saquon Barkley and said, Hey, we have no interest in trading you. You want to be here, right? Like we just want to make sure you want to be here. And then he's like, yes, I want to be here. He's like, perfect. We're on the same page, like human to human. And then you turn it over to Brian Dayball. They're like, how do you deal with this? And instead of being like, you know, the cutthroat Joe judge way, it's my way or the highway, put a wall up between personal and professional. He's like, at the end of the day, these are people like I'm in a people business. I need them to trust me. So I want to act with empathy 
first. And that like this whole regime is just the, the polar opposite of what we've been accustomed to the last two years. So, and I like it for the most part, Brian Dable, like he, when they asked about, you know, what are you going to do with certain players or how are you going to look at the draft? Like he said, hey, you know, he's like, listen, it's my first time doing it. Right. Like, you know, I, I coached a lot of defense. Then I was coaching offense in Buffalo. And you're like, like you say, authenticity, it does feel good. Um, it, oh, all positive vibes. But do you take a brief pause and you like at, at some point you like, and you just go like, okay, like I, lo- I like the contrast. If I'm choosing out of the two, I prefer what I'm getting from Joe Shane and Brian Dable. Cause it does feel like you're getting real insights to how they feel about building a roster, how they feel about communicating with players, regardless of what decisions get made, right? They're not giving anything away here, but do you think that this, like, obviously this is predicated on success, right? If the team does well, then the authenticity is a delight. If the team struggles, then I think what it's going to be is like, oh, I'll be your Huckleberry, right? Like you're going to be like, oh, you guys kind of look like two ho-hum, don't don't know what you're doing, bumbling your way through it. I don't think that's the case, but this is what happens, right? When Joe Shane came in, Oh, sorry. When Joe Judge came in, it was like, listen, maybe they need a hard-nosed guy that's going to get, get their nose to the grindstone and make it happen. Cut two, it doesn't result in anything on the field. And you go, Maybe this guy's an idiot and he's just been blowing smoke the entire time. Well, so there, there is that like, obviously whatever happens on the field, like you could be whatever type of coach. And they're like, that's the reason why success has happened, even though there's like not a direct correlation. But, but to me, the simple thing is this, they, they, had, they talked to Brian Dable and they were talking about the offensive line. And he's like, we are going to be looking to add a tackle in the draft. And yeah. like, they were asking him, are you looking to do any of that? If if Brian Dable came out and said, nope, we have no interest in drafting a tackle in the NFL draft, like, wouldn't you just be like, why are you lying to me? Like, just don't lie to me. Like, it's obvious that we need a right tackle. It's obvious to everyone. So if you, like, think you're going to be coy and, like, play gamesmanship with other people, it's not going to work, and it just looks foolish. So, like, for me, just be a normal person and keep it real. There's certain things that you have to keep behind closed doors and talk with the players about. But other things that are just like blatantly obvious, if you lie to me, then I'm not going to believe any other words that come out of your mouth. No, 100%. The last thing we'll say here before we get into, I want to want to try to paint this positive picture. Um, when you hear Joe Shane say, we're not taking any calls on Saquon Barkley, that can be authentic. The Giants are not taking any calls. When he calls Saquon Barkley to tell him, like, we're not looking to trade you. Again, now, what I think, like, I, I'm still going to read between the lines there a little bit and say, like, we're not looking to. It doesn't mean we won't. Right. Like, and, and to your point, I think the most important thing from a player side of it is just communicate with me. You, you call me up Joe Shane and you say, listen, like we're not taking calls on you. We're not looking to move you. I wouldn't be shocked if Joe Shane is being authentic, that he's communicating with Saquon Barkley. Obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're re- trying to revamp this franchise. We want you to be a part of it. But. If somebody comes a knocking, right, if the right deal gets made here, like to me, that's still what I read in between the lines on Saquon Barkley's situation is if the right deal comes across, yes, we are going to be willing to trade you. Saying we're not looking to trade you and we are not going to trade you is a very gentle nuance there inside of that, something that that ultimately may not play out because it just the Giants may, as we heard early in the offseason, have set such a high price tag of a first rounder for Saquon that that prevents anyone from legitimately making an offer. Look, Adam, I love doing this show with you. Thank you. We do, we, you, you know, yin and yang, Cheech and Chong. We got this thing going on. <laughs> I am not, I am not looking to move on from our partnership with you. There you go. I'm not, I'm not making any phone calls. I'm very happy. I'd love to do this with you for the next three years. If Al Michaels calls my phone and he's like, Hey, by the way, I've got this whole network and, and stuff. Are you interested mm. in doing it? Like I'd be a fool not to consider it. So like it's, you can never say never on any trade of any player. We don't want to trade Leonard Williams. We don't want to trade Kadarius Tony. We don't want to trade Saquon Barkley. You don't want to trade whomever. If they were to offer five first round picks, it would be malpractice to not (laughs) trade Saquon Barkley. Like there's always a tipping point where, where like reasonable heads need to prevail. No one is untouchable in any walk of life. So like, yes, would we trade Saquon Barkley if they came came up with an overwhelming package? The answer is yes, but Joe Shane knows he's not getting that, so it's just easy to say I'm not looking to move you. Right, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Which, by the way, though, does erode a little bit of the authenticity. This is interesting. We're having we're having a a, a, a tat tat. We don't know we don't know which way it's going to go, but let's go this way with it, my friends. 
if we believe that Brian Dable and Joe Shane are being authentic, and I think that they are, I think that it's fun to hear a coach be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring it out. I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants. I'm excited about it. I have the background and the credentials to say that I can be successful at this, but we are in an active process of learning. And that's always something that I think is important too. not coming in and having a sense that you already have proven it and you already know what the success is going to look like going forward. So if we want to paint, because we've been talking a lot about who's staying, who's going, Bradbury getting traded, should Barkley get traded, Daniel Jones, is he, is he not the franchise quarterback? This season is obviously not one where the Giants are looking to win. But let's try to paint a picture where Saquon Barkley does not get traded, where Daniel Jones is the quarterback for the year ahead, and where another key player on the offensive side of the ball is going to give you something close to the best sample size of his career. What could that mean for the New York football Giants season? Kenny Galladay, I put the numbers up in front of you. 93 targets, 52 receptions, 952 yards, and eight touchdowns. That represents 80% of his 2019 production, his best year of his NFL career. Do you think, first, that Kenny Galladay is still capable of producing at that level? Yes, I do. Do you find it? This is good. This is like a, it's like a dissertation. Uh, do you find it alarming that 52 receptions on 93 catches is pretty much on par for what his numbers are. Like this guy catches a little over half the balls. Like I was surprised to see when you look year by year, even last year set over seven, uh, 67 targets, 30 plus catches only had one drop, but you know, contested ball. Sure. But this guy's kind of a 50, 50 jump ball player, which was a little bit surprising to me, even going back pre New York giants days, when I looked from afar and liked the big body receiver, that was Kenny Galladay and said, man, like big body receiver can make plays in the red zone. Sure. But not necessarily. I don't know if he ever should have been looked at as like a high level one for an offensive system. Okay. So that's interesting that you mentioned that because when you look at those stats, Adam, you may say like, Oh, you know, a thousand, almost a thousand yards and eight touchdowns. Like where would that put him rankings wise? And, sure. and let's just look back at last year. That would put him right around 26th or 27th in the league in terms of yards for the entire season yep. and right around the same area with eight touchdowns would, would be the same. The the type of wide receivers that you're looking at in that range, in no, in, in particular order from 25 to 27 are Jalen Waddle, sure. Hollywood Brown and Christian Kirk, who just got paid a boatload of money from the Jacksonville Jaguars. Right? <laughs> so, so what, what, what you're saying is like, can Kenny Galladay be a top 30 wide receiver again in this league for one season? My answer is yes, because mm -hmm. we've seen him be better than that. Obviously injuries, obviously the offensive line. It does concern me a little bit about his catch percentage. But when you think about the type of receiver he is, he's not doing short slant routes. They're not getting the ball to him in space like they would Kadarius Tony. They're looking for him to be the big time big contested catch, go up and get it red zone target that we know he can be. Yeah, I think that that's fair. Um, and, and again, it's funny because inside of that list, you have guys that have been in the league for a little bit, a young player that's that's about to take his ascension, right? You're so it, It's weird to think like, can you kind of be a developing young talent for a year, right? Like 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 a waddle or a guy that you would never want to be, although seemingly paying a similar amount of money in Christian Kirk potentially. So I think it is possible. And I think the real the real thing you come out of this with is like he can't be the focal point. One of the guys we're not going to talk about because of the injuries is obviously Kadarius Tony didn't give you a full sample size. The presumption here inside of this positive vibe conversation is that Kadarius Tony is on the field. He's playing, he's healthy, and he's giving you exactly the sample size we saw last year, right? Dynamic playmaker, freak on the field, making guys miss, and he is your number one wide receiver. So if you look at Kenny Galladay and say, can you give me 952 yards and eight touchdowns as a second option on this offense? I'd be excited to take that. When we turn our attention then over, though, to another player that we were just talking about as well, someone who's not getting traded, and that's Saquon Barkley. Now, this one's a little bit tricky because you go back to his rookie year. I mean, the numbers are about as impressive as they could possibly be. But can Saquon Barkley at 80% give you 1,000 yards at 4.5 yards a clip? Can he give you 68 receptions for 540 yards and 12 total touchdowns? I The big question for me is going to be the reception piece because we haven't seen that carry over year to year, injuries and everything else. Saquon steps on the field. He's 100% healthy this year. Can he give you 15, 1,600 all-purpose yards? 
So again, I like to think of the comparable, like what would that look like in the league? Where yeah, would that put Saquon Barkley? Like where, do, where, where would that number put him? So 80% of what we've seen of Saquon will put him about seventh or eighth in terms of rushing yards in the league. And you may say like, well, what does that mean? It kind of puts him near uh, Ezekiel Elliott, Elijah Mitchell, and Antonio Gibson, right? You know, Derrick Henry's there, but he got hurt halfway through the season, so he's like a freak of nature, doesn't really count. By but the way, just two guys on rookie contracts inside of that then there, and one guy who obviously we know is on a bit of a decline, a bit of a bloated contract. So that's actually an interesting sample size because you're talking about the big decision that looms if the Giants keep Saquon Barkley, right? Are you going to spend money on this player? Here's two young guys that are doing it, doing it at a high level or a comparable level. And one guy that you wish you were paying less to be doing that. Yeah, well, exactly. And, and so for me, like, again, the, the question that you're asking of like, can he do it? Can he replicate what Antonio Gibson is giving the commanders? Like, yes, of course. Like he has that ability in it. We've already seen it happen once. Like I watched him with my own two eyes already exceed all of these numbers. Now, if you're saying, will it happen? That's a that's a bigger challenge, just knowing that health has been such a concern for Saquon Barkley. And, and so for me, like I think this is a good target. Like a thousand yards and 10 touchdowns is what you expect from an eight million dollar running back who you drafted number two overall, and you're hoping to make the focal point of your offense. Yeah. And so now now we're talking about taking again, second option at wide receiver. We understand that. But you're looking at back at both these players and you're talking about 20 touchdowns in production over the course of the year, right? And when you think about how there was no touchdown production on the offensive side of the ball last year. This would not only be, we were taking like 80%. This is only like a 9,000% jump in, in touchdown production of, for these players. But here's what I think, I think it brought me to. So just real, let's take the quick pause here. If you tell me that Kenny Galladay is going to go for almost 1,000 yards and eight touchdowns and Saquon Barkley is going to give you even, even 1,300 all-purpose yards from the line of scrimmage and 10, you know, 10 total touchdowns receiving and rushing, would that, would you think, that the Giants have had a competitive season. Would you say, oh, if that's what's on paper offensively, knowing that we're going to add some pieces through the draft, this team is going to be battling around 500 down the stretch. Do you think that these stats can exist in a vacuum where it doesn't impact the wins and loss total? And it can just be, yeah, these are stats that really, don't, again, don't matter in a year where the Giants are trying to turn things over. Our defense played Okay, last year they gave up a lot of touchdowns at the end of the half. It was a lot of game changing, back breaking touchdowns with under two minutes to go. But really, the reason why we lost is because we couldn't manufacture any offense. We were, you know, 16 and a half, 17 points per game. We were towards the bottom of the league in all statistical categories, basically on offense. If you're telling me we get an influx of 20 something touchdowns between Saquon Barkley and Kenny Galladay when we basically had nothing between the two of them, you know, a handful, like one or two touchdowns between the two of them. Like you're talking about adding 20 touchdowns to the mix. I mean, 10 or 12 from, from Kenny Galladay would be huge. That then you're talking about the potential tight end position. You're talking about Kadarius Tony. You're talking about Darius Slayton. If you throw in three, four, five touchdowns from each of these guys, all of a sudden, you're looking at Daniel Jones has to be able to have at least what 20 touchdowns because who's throwing him the football. If all these people have three to five touchdowns, right? And by the way, cause we're gonna get to Daniel Jones here in a second, but by the way, it's like Kenny Galladay's production specifically, you can like, you could tell me that he gets close to a thousand yards receiving and maybe he only has four touchdowns on the year. But if you can point to five or six instances in the red zone where his value of just being on the field and commanding the attention is what help opens up for Saquon Barkley or for Kadarius Tony or for, Hey, fingers crossed Sterling Shepard or Ricky seals, you know, Ricky seals Jones out of the tight end position. Like if, if you see a very clear indication that safeties are caught watching Kenny Galladay because of his size, then you, you're, you're going to give him, Hey, that's half a touchdown worth of credit for you, right? If you're a coaching staff and what his value is. Well, I so here's a question, uh, which will go a little bit more towards Kenny Galladay because, you know, sure. Saquon, we kind of understand he's going to be running the ball. It's not, you know, he's kind of a little bit on his own in terms of his production, whereas Daniel and Kenny's Jones a far bigger question mark, right? I mean, well, if healthy right. Saquon, we all agree. Saquon is, he's Saquon Barkley, we think still. If, if you look at the wide receiver room as a whole, Adam, and we say that they end up having... 24 touchdowns between them. Does it matter to you who scores those touchdowns? Like, does it need to be Saquon Bark? I mean, Saquon Bark. Uh, Kenny Galladay has 14 of those touchdowns. Sterling Shepard has five. Darius Slayton has three to four. 
Like, what if it was a spread out mix of like oh, sure. eight, eight for Sterling Shepard, eight for Kenny Galladay, eight for Darius Slayton? Is that just as good for you? Is it better or is it worse? Oh, no, I'm fine with it because, by the way, as we're going to turn our attention to Daniel Jones, it's like, if you t- first of all, if you told me Sterling Shepard catches eight touchdowns, I mean, my God, what a dream. Um, But it just means that it means the offensive system is working because it means that the touchdowns, the scoring, the success is predicated on the system and making the right reads and spreading the ball around. It's not predicated on force feeding any one individual player. And then likewise, I mean, whether it's Saquon Barkley in the backfield, whether it's Kadarius Tony, like we would all agree, Tony is the elite talent inside of the wide receiver room. And yet, it doesn't mean that like, not unlike with uh, with Eli Manning at the back end when he had OBJ, right? Trying to force feed a ball into a receiver because you know how good he is. You want to use his talent. And sometimes it could actually end up impacting the team negatively because defenses start to really focus in on that. Fun fact about the touchdowns for wide receivers. You think about all these big name wide receivers that put up these big gaudy numbers of touchdowns. Did you know that if you, as a receiver this past year, caught six touchdowns, you were in the top 25 for oh. receiving touchdowns in the league. So, like, only six gets you into the top 25. So, if you had Kenny Galladay getting eight, Sterling Shepard getting six, and, and Darius Slayton getting seven, that would put all three of them, theoretically, in the top 25 of the league. Like, th- that, to me, is insane. Like, I expected the number to be 10, right? Now, like, I'll also take 15 total touchdowns from from – you know, Kadarius Tony, right? Combined rush. I haven't even mentioned uh, him. That's why I was, I was kind of putting him out. of Yeah, no, hundred percent. No, you're right though. That that actually is a really good number because saying like, I mean, six touchdowns isn't nothing, but it also doesn't feel like, again, we're talking about like number one or close to number one production, but the idea that you could be like, yeah, I'm a top 30. I'm a top 30 guy. When it comes to touchdown production at the wide receiver position, you can actually accomplish that. And by the way, it's like, it's probably how let's assume Darius Slayton is going to be on this roster. Like this is how you create your value. Give me if you give me four or five touchdowns as the third or fourth option in this offense, that means that even on 40 catches on the year, even being a 50% ratio guy, it still means you can be giving me top 30 production in, in a very important area, scoring points. Think about this. It, if you were to have six touchdowns or even five touchdowns, you're talking about these wide receivers scoring a touchdown once every three and a half games of the season. Like yeah. they, you could go multiple games without scoring a touchdown and you're still on track to, ha- to be a top 25 receiver. Well, my friend, this is all lovely. It's a delight. It's a treasure. But the question then becomes what can Daniel Jones accomplish? Because we're talking about 80% of Kenny Galladay, 80% of Saquon Barkley. So the question rather than can, can Daniel Jones produce 80% of his best year? That's not exactly going to be a glowing standard you're setting. Why not compare him to someone that, whether or not it's justifiable, everyone says, hey, remember, very similar skill set to Josh Allen in Buffalo. So can Daniel Jones give you 80% of the production of Josh Allen? Between the last two years, we know they've been very similar, where Josh Allen has thrown for 4,500, 4,400 yards, 37 and 36 touchdowns, 10 and 15 interceptions, right? So the way that I looked at this just quickly here was, and then I have, then I have a follow-up question on this. Daniel Jones, you're setting the standard for Daniel Jones. 80% of Josh Allen's production would be 3,500 yards, 29 touchdowns. And then I elevated and said 120% of the interceptions because Daniel Jones is a little bit more turnover friendly, right? So 29 up, 15 down, 500 rushing yards, throw in three or four touchdowns on the ground. And I actually kept that number pretty high. I didn't do 80% because he's shown the ability to be as productive with his legs as Josh Allen can be. Do you think that Daniel Jones can be? 80% of Josh Allen, not just from a height and weight standpoint, but also from a statistical standpoint. Yes. And, and and the reason why Adam is because his rookie year, he wasn't that far off from the numbers that you have in front of you right now. Like Eli Manning started the, the first game in the transition to Daniel Jones. But when we look at Daniel Jones, his rookie year, he threw for 3000 yards, had 24 touchdowns and 12 interceptions. Now it's not 29, touchdowns but it's also not 15 interceptions you're kind of moving up one calibrating a little bit less there you know a couple hundred yards also combined for 21 touchdowns and 17 interceptions over the last two seasons oh 100 now the question is more obviously you know first year was under pat Shermer. then you have joe judge and jason garrett which Mm -hmm. one which one shows you a little bit more of, of the true daniel jones reflection to me i i honestly think that the, the potential is there from 2019 where you see like Pat Shermer in that, in that open offense for as much as he was criticized, like 
he still got as much as he could out of Daniel Jones. So for me, when like I think that is the hope for Daniel Jones is that stat line that you have there would put him in in pretty good company because we think Josh Allen's pretty great. Like 29 touchdowns for Daniel Jones would be exciting, and I think that's kind of where we sit. And as a frame of reference, where would 29 touchdowns put you in the league? Put you right in ninth place. So you'd be having a top 10 passing touchdown quarterback in Daniel Jones. Yeah, and top listen, top 10 in any in any category is going to be worth it. You're, you're not going to scoff at what the what, you know, what's the yardage? Is 3500 yards enough by today's NFL standards? Hey, it is what it is. The question then though that I would ask is and I think that it is possible. He can accomplish that. And let's just take the, the brief pause here and ask it again. Do you think that that leads to the Giants having success this season? Do you think that that would be 29 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, a handful of rushing touchdowns? Let's just say he only has a handful of fumbles, keeps those kind of under control. That combined with the production we're talking about from these other offensive positions are the Giants. That Can we sit here and then say, hey, if these things kind of happen, and, let, and let's let's just be clear, bring the touchdown number down on Kenny Galladay because I feel like that's setting a very high bar, right, relative to what he's done. But let's just assume the yardage, the receptions are there, and likewise for Barkley. Is a line like that for Daniel Jones enough for us to sit here and say, hey, this team can be winning they could be 14 games through the season sitting there at six and eight. They could be 15 games, you know, can they be eight and eight, 16 games through the season talking about trying to have a winning record? Or is it going to be that, yes, the offense can look better, but based on the team overall, they could still be losing a lot of these games. Well, that's a great question. And I have an answer for you, Adam, because I know you go to me for all the facts. So I told you that it would put him uh, in the top 10 in terms of passing touchdowns. And, and sure. what, what does that actually mean for team success? Well, in the top 10, there are only two quarterbacks this past year that threw for as many touchdowns as you're saying we may see, like projected for Daniel Jones, that didn't make the playoffs. So in that top 10, 80% of the quarterbacks that are in that grouping have made the playoffs. The only two that didn't were Kirk Cousins, who – say whatever you want. Like he, you know, he's a stat stat patter at number nine and Justin Herbert uh, of, of the chargers finished third in that. Right. So like right. When, when you think about where that would put Daniel Jones, if you're in the top 10, you have a very, very good likelihood of making the playoffs. And if 80% not chance that you're going to be on a playoff team. Right. And, and like, you know, I, I think Carson Wentz finished 10th or 11th there, and they were one win away at the end of the year to, to for Indy to be able to make the playoffs. You look at Justin Herbert, the Chargers were pretty close to making the playoffs. Kirk Cousins is kind of the outlier where, like, he always has these maddening stats, but, like, does it ever equate to, like, big wins for his team? But, yes, Adam, if your quarterback's throwing 30, almost 30 touchdowns, you're going to be in a ton of games, right? And the Giants' defense isn't porous. They're not worst in the league. So if you're putting up two, two passing touchdowns, you know, a passing touchdown and a half a game, like you're already getting 10 to 14 points just from your quarterback alone. So we did not, I did not reveal this information to Andy Makowitz before we started the show, because as we've talked about over the course of the off season, we've had these conversations saying about what can Daniel Jones be? I, I'd be happy for Daniel Jones to turn out to be the franchise quarterback. And I quickly want to frame it this way as we're talking about, Hey, what if he throws for almost 30 touchdowns this year? The one difference I will say is while the money is going to matter, and that's a big factor in this, the other side of it is Daniel Jones can be 24, 25 years old. There's still another decade of him playing high level QB play. If he stays healthy, right? Like, so I think sometimes you do take the step back and just reframe that. Yes. He's in his fourth year, but it doesn't mean this isn't a running back. It doesn't mean that he's 80% of the way through his shelf life. Like I, like you may look at with Saquon Barkley, you sit here and you go, no, this is a guy that could play for another 10, 12, 13 years. If he's healthy and be a very productive franchise quarterback. Okay, fine. But you had said, I think that Daniel Jones can be a top 15 quarterback in the league. And that's good enough, right? You can win with that in the league. So the question then becomes a name that you just mentioned. Do you want Kirk cousins? Because that's kind of what you're painting the picture of here. You're painting the picture of a guy in Daniel Jones that could be top 15 in a lot of quarter categories, maybe fringe top 10 in some, you know, in touchdowns, et cetera, the yardage, be a guy that, that puts up good stats and puts up good numbers. But when it comes down to it, Kirk Cousins is one of the last quarterbacks that you want in a big spot to win the win a game to make the playoffs, to win a playoff game, to go on a playoff run. Kirk Cousins is widely regarded as the, the, the quarterback in the league that you go, no, don't look at the stats. Look at what this guy does when it matters most. Look at what his track record is overall. 
He's not a guy that anyone would be taking to say, I got to go win that big game to make it to the Super Bowl. Not Kirk Cousins. And if I told you that you get Kirk Cousins, that that is Daniel Jones' career, statistically, you might love it. But I don't think that I don't think for a second that you're going to turn around and say, yes, sign me up for a Kirk Cousins type career from Daniel Jones. Would you? I look at Kirk Cousins very simply that he can make you a competitive team. And I've said before that, like, as long as you can get to the like get to the opportunity to, to go to the postseason and then anything can happen. Look at a guy like Jimmy Garoppolo. He has very similar stats to Kirk Cousins. Now, he can't stay healthy, but he's also gone to the Super Bowl before and been to the NFC Championship chain. Kirk Cousins has made the playoffs. There's a reason why the Vikings are still paying him $35, $40 million a year because they know the grass isn't always greener. And like, if you get rid of Kirk Cousins, you you could just be in purgatory. Right, but you said before, yeah, but you and I talked before about pay, how much money Kirk Cousins had make, and you, you, and also I'm saying you because in this particular conversation, you're defending the Daniel Jones side of things. You've said it's insane how much money that the Vikings have paid to Kirk Cousins. Like, it's nuts that they're paying him what they're paying him. So, how can it be that you think it's objectively nuts to be paying him that and then be saying, but the Giants should be willing to potentially pay Daniel Jones? Daniel Jones should be able to make. $250 million over the next 10 years playing for the Giants and being a, yeah, pretty good, you know, slightly above average, but never actually getting it done for you. That's the going rate for what a quarterback costs. If you want a top 15 quarterback in this league, look at what Derek Carr is going to get paid. He's not even in the top 10 of passing touchdowns. He's going to get $40 million a year. This is the going rate to have a oh, competent quarterback. Year, he, I, I believe he will be too, but this is, this is what the going rate is for a top 15 quarterback in the league that keeps you competitive and gives you an opportunity to make the playoffs. Then you have this upper echelon cream of the crop elite of the elite that you're confident that you could win the Super Bowl with. It doesn't always match up. No one, no one went into this year thinking Joe Burrow was a top two or three quarterback in the league. They said, Hey, he's a young guy. He looks promising. They got to the playoffs. They made noise. That's what you're hoping for with a guy like Kirk cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr, et cetera. Oh, but man, do I think you just insulted the F out of Joe Burrow that you lumped him in with Jimmy Garoppolo and Kirk Cousins. Joe Burrow came out of college clearly as a guy that could develop into a top flight quarterback like that. That is that is a a heck of a bowl that you're putting those same players into. No, I'm saying at the start of last season. Oh, no sure. One but, had yeah, Joe but, Burrow yeah, as a top saying, five like, quarterback. At the time of being drafted, nobody thought that Kirk Cousins like, you know, what I'm saying like nobody. Joe Burrow came into the league being considered one of the, he was one of the best QB prospects like that. Oh, that's what the standard was. When is he but, going to get there? Wait and see. J- uh, Justin Herbert. When is he going to get there? Wait and see. Derek Carr and Kirk Cousins and you know Jimmy Garoppolo. These guys are well into their careers and have established what they are or are not. Likewise, the same way that Daniel Jones and uh, we'll, we'll get out of here on which this one has been mostly positive, but it's kind of gotten a little dark here at the end uh, with Daniel Jones. You're you're entering into the fourth year. And at the end of the day, the question does become, we're talking about, listen, we're, you know, percentages of can he be 80% of Josh Allen? Okay, if he can be 80% of Josh Allen, though, the bigger question is going to be 29 touchdowns, 30 touchdowns. Are five or six of those when you're down by 13 points in the fourth quarter and it kind of doesn't matter, right? When you score a last minute touchdown that gets you within a single score with 30 seconds left and you don't get the onside kick. Like, that's probably the difference if we're talking about feeling positive about the upcoming season. I'm not, I'm really not worried about wins and losses. You can still tell me that the giants only get five or six wins this year. And Daniel Jones proves that you can go with him at least for a contract, right? At least for a five year, $150 million contract and see how it plays itself out over a handful of seasons. But if I look at those stat lines and 25% of what I see on paper is predicated on when the game was already lost, that he's showing that, then the window, like you got, you got to take into account that window dressing that he sometimes does. Something that, by the way, I think Kirk Cousins does too, right? Like his stats kind of get there slow and steady over accumulation. And then when you get inside wins or losses, in or out of games, those things matter a little bit too. He's proverbially the game manager as opposed to a game winner. And that's really why I pose that. At the end of the day, are you comfortable with having a game manager as opposed to someone who could be a game winner? Because that's what Kirk Cousins is and the question around what Daniel Jones can or cannot be. Three, five, four, six, and four. Do not give out your social security number. Do not do that. Those are the amount of wins the Giants have over the last five seasons. They're like worst in the league. I just want a competitive team. And if a game manager means we're fighting for a playoff spot or we make the playoffs, 
Give me that. I want progress out of, I can't, we can't be winning three games a year and feel like we're making progress. And just real quick, who was the quarterback the last two seasons? Oh, it was Daniel Jones. Okay. Just touching base. Listen, we're going to come back in. We're going to keep this kind of conversation going. I think there are worlds where the giants can be a competitive team, where they can be exciting for the fan base this year, where, you know, by the end of the year, maybe wins and losses don't matter as much, but they've been exciting. They've they've been, had you invest in those games on Sundays, something that the last three, four years, you flat out have not necessarily wanted to do. It's why doing a podcast about the Giants has been difficult at times because we keep ourselves invested in what has been a disaster. You get over on YouTube. You check us out over there. You follow, you like it, you subscribe to, you get the podcast, you get those needs fulfilled. We'll keep trying to paint these pictures. What do the Giants need to add in the upcoming draft to make this the kind of season that's exciting for the fan base and maybe gives us some silver linings on Daniel Jones, on Saquon Barkley, on Kenny Galladay, on Sterling Shepard to give us this sense that, yes, the franchise is going in the right direction under earnest and honest Brian Dable and Joe Shane. In the meantime, friends, as Andy Makowitz would always want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.